continues to keep this body in a never-ending spiral of spending more money uh, with, with these bloated spending bills. And um, on, on our side of the aisle, my colleagues and I tend to try to balance a budget in 10 years. Um, we, we focused on that with the Budget Committee and worked there. But since I've been here in the last uh, almost seven years, we can't, it's more and more difficult to accomplish that in a 10-year window. Yesterday's budget released by President Biden just pushes us further down the wrong path. I mean, if we think our debts now, if we follow the plan proposed by the president, uh, which it even includes tax increases, our national debt would be $52.7 trillion in 10 years. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to submit for the record my op-ed entitled, uh, Three Ways to Treat America's Debt Pandemic. Uh, in it, I outline that's not just our national debt, uh, but that's a problem, but that household debt has also reached a high of $17.5 trillion this year. Families are struggling to pay their debt uh, because of the inflation and because of taking on credit card and other debt is only exacerbating that national fi fiscal crisis. Dr. Falkender, it, it seems that there are correlations between personal finances and our national finance, uh, fiscal situation. Uh, the, the inflation uh, from Bidenomics uh, has created a turbulent economy, economy for working families. They've taken on more debt and we're facing higher interest rates while at the same time the federal government's spending more that's bringing in and having to figure out how to pay uh, higher interest rates on its debt. What are some of the public policies that have caused this and how do you think or is there a relationship between personal and, and uh, national finances? Sure, so if we think about the economy that was in place in January of 2021, we were seeing a, a nice recovery from the pandemic. We had recovered by middle of 2021, we had returned to both the economic output prior to the pandemic and the level of employment. And yet at the beginning of the Biden administration, an additional $2 trillion of fiscal stimulus was thrown into an economy that was largely already recovered. And so as a result, we saw inflation here in the United States take off much faster than elsewhere around the world, coupled with an administration who singularly focused on reducing the ability of the United States to be energy independent, to take energy resources offline. We saw that the energy sector didn't recover until 2023, despite the rest of the economy in 21. So all of those things stimulated demand at a time that we were curtailing the ability of the US economy to fulfill that demand. The natural result is inflation. Now, the Federal Reserve then came in late to the party in order to try to curtail some of the excess, you know, the really low interest rate environment that was in place. And in order to catch up, they, they increased interest rates extremely quickly. We saw mortgage interest rates go from about 3 to about 7%. So not only are American households now facing 30% higher energy prices, 20% higher food prices, but the, the interest rate on a 30-year mortgage has, as I said, taken a $250,000 mortgage from about $1,000 a month principal and interest payment to over $1,600. And the least, the lowest income amongst us are the ones that are hit, hard, hit hardest by it because shelter, energy, and food comprise a much larger portion, portion of their consumption than any other demographic. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, I'm just so concerned about, uh, as you mentioned, inflation is such a, a burden for so many individuals, and, and uh, we, we've got to get that under control. We have to have good fiscal policy and not uh, excessive spending over our revenue that, that brings that in. And speaking about revenue, I just want to say one quick comment, Mr. Chairman, is that I do want to correct the record on the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. I mean, we have consistently uh, brought in more tax revenue than what the Congressional Budget Office estimated after the, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was passed. Uh, in 2023, we saw almost $300 billion more in tax revenue than what had been estimated by the CBO. In 2022, it was over $900 billion. And in 2020, it was over uh, 200, roughly 280. So the, the revenue has come in because of the economy moving. And uh, that's one of the things that we've got to keep in mind as we look at having good pro-growth policies. Thank you, and I yield back. Mr. Uh, Dr. Klossing, I wanted to ask you about what you referred to as American last tax policy. Um, and so specifically, I wanted to probe two points of this. One is you say that, um, this is like footnote six, if you want to get real technical, you say early evidence um, suggests um, that the Tax Cut and Job Act's um, incentives created increased foreign investment, which I think would be the opposite of making America great again. It would actually be helping our 
our foreign competitors. Can you tell me more about that evidence? Yes, absolutely. Courage offshoring and, and profit shifting. One is a 50% discount for foreign income relative to U.S. income. And the second is an exemption completely free of U.S. tax for the first 10% return on foreign assets. If, if you think about those two in concert, they lead to incentives to both move plant and equipment offshore because then the first 10% return will be completely free of tax, which isn't true you know, here in, in the United States, and to book as much profit as possible offshore where we'll get a 50% discount. And it's actually a little more um, uh, perverse than that because even if you have income in a high tax country offshore um, or at least a, a medium tax country offshore, you can use the foreign tax credits from that income, combine it with your income in haven jurisdictions and still get to half the US rate. So you'd rather have income in, in France or Japan than you would have it in the United States too because it'll generate those foreign tax credits to offset tax due on lower tax jurisdictions like Switzerland. So I represent um, about 700,000 Americans. How do they benefit from increased foreign investment? Um, there are benefits to international capital and, and international trade, and I've, I've written a whole book about that. Um, but I don't think we want a tax system that puts a thumb on the scale in favor of the foreign relative to the domestic, right? We also benefit from having these investments here at home um, and from jobs and, and the other things that go with plant and equipment, right? So um, when you're looking at kind of like the bang for the buck of what we got from all of those corporate tax cuts, I think that money would have been much better spent on some of the investments that, that Mr. Linden referred to, like the early childhood education. My um, second question is about competition competition policy, which has been a big focus of the Biden administration. My colleagues um, on both sides of the aisle love to talk about small business and how they're so pro small and medium business. How does the Tax Cut and Jobs Act um, affect um, competition policy? In other words, the corporate tax base is very concentrated. So when we reduce corporate taxes, who gets helped among businesses and who gets hurt? Yeah, that's a, a really interesting point, and I'm glad you asked that question, because one underappreciated fact is just how concentrated that corporate tax base is. There are about a half million C-Corp payers in the United States, and less than one half of 1% of them, fewer than 2,000, account for 90% of, of the tax base, uh, approximately. So if, if you look at where all of that tax revenue went, it mostly went to just a small handful of companies. About 300 of them account for 70% of the tax base. And those are companies that disproportionately have very high profits, have market power, and have multinational operations. So they can even self-help themselves to a much lower rate than the US domestic rate by moving profit offshore. So our current corporate tax policy favors the very largest corporations um, and they get about, the, the, the top 300 company, corporations get about 70%, they pay about 70% of the um, tax base. So I guess my question is, um, again, who, why would you have that tax policy? Who is, what ordinary American who might want to start a business, how are they helped by this? I think there's a strong argument for treating the largest companies differently than the smaller companies, in part because I think they're less um, likely to be incentivized by things like investment incentives because they already have all the money they need to do all of these investments. I think we've got it backwards right now and that we're giving the biggest companies a lighter tax burden than the smallest companies in, in a lot of ways. And I think that shoring up the international tax system is the first step to fixing that. Because if you try to just do it all through the domestic system, the big guys can still move the income mm -hmm. offshore. So uh, the first step, fix the international, and then you can fix the corporate rate structure after that. I'll, I'll just close by observing that the first time I came across the phrase guilty, which is G-I-L-T-I -I in tax world, I, I was sort of struck by the fact that it's called guilty which is what the Tax Cut and Jobs Act is actually guilty of. Um, they are guilty of creating a tax system that benefits the largest corporations over the smallest ones and benefiting um, uh, corporations over American workers. I yield back.
Oh, you one classmate. Um, so I didn't plan on delving into tax policy, although I think it's important when we're looking at the prospects of staving off a debt crisis and growing the economy, which redu re reducing spending, growing the economy, um, tax policy is inevitably and should be a conversation. Um, but I think we got to get the facts right here, and I, I'm not sure I'm, I'm not sure the facts as I've heard them line up. As a Ways and Means Committee member, um, we brought in record revenue to the Treasury after the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Dr. Faulkner, is that correct? Um, we saw record, record R&D investment and capital, by trillions flowing from overseas to this country. And do you know why? Because we had the highest corporate tax rates in the free world and the not so free world. Like communist China had lower corporate tax rates than the United States of America. Listen, I, I, it's not the gospel of Jesus for me to suggest that a tax rate is at one point or another, but I can tell you this, just from West Texas common sense, we cannot grow this economy and we cannot have our job creators in the United States be competitive if we have the highest tax rates in the world. Now, I would hope we could all agree on that, regardless of where we negotiate the right place. We're not even in... I don't even know that we're in the top quartile. Maybe we are. I think we're more in the middle now and not dead last. And it's amazing what TCJA did. Was it perfect? No. Um, like I said, I'm not dogmatic about it, but the lower rates for individuals benefited the lowest income families and individuals. That's a proven fact. The people who benefited on the individual tax rate side were those at the lower end. And here's another fact. The tax cut, the tax code is more progressive after TCJA than it was before. It's more progressive. We have more people at the higher income paying more taxes than at the lower income, and more people paying no taxes uh, than, uh, than there were before. That's, that's just a fact. Um, it may be inconvenient, but it's also probably inconvenient that the, after TCJA and we reduced the tax burden on American families and, and job creators, that we had the lowest poverty rates in recorded history. Do you know that, Dr. Clausen, that we had the lowest poverty rates after we reduced taxes in this country on our working families and on businesses? Do you, yes or no, do you, do you uh, agree that we achieve the lowest poverty rates? Poverty rates were going down in part because of the macroeconomy, but I think even the American Enterprise Institute analysis of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act would disagree with you on several of the points you just raised. Okay, I'm not asking about yeah. several points, uh -huh. but the poverty rate was record low after TCJA. We had record uh, corporate revenue to the Treasury. We had the lowest unemployment rate for women and minorities. These are all facts that happened uh, I think in large part because of pro-growth policies from the previous administration. Not all uh, related to tax cut, but America first trade, deregulation, and the combination of those things, including, by the way, incentivizing people who are able to work to work. Not people who are not, not people who can't, but those who can work should work and so, because, because one of the big constraints for growth is, is a labor shortage, uh, which is a whole nother conversation. But we're certainly not going to solve that when we're paying people more to stay home than to go back to work. And that's certainly what happened during ARPA and some of my Democrat colleagues and their policies, whether they intended that or not. Listen, I don't know a single person in this country that I've talked to who is well-informed who believes that the level of indebtedness record for this country, that the fiscal path with, in terms of deficits and the projections from CBO of $120 trillion on top of the 34, believe this is sustainable and are not terrified at the prospect of a debt-related crisis. Not any objective or serious person 
believes that, including our Democrat witness from our fiscal State of the Union in this very room, Mark Zandi from Bloomberg Analytics, and, and other nonpartisans like our Comptroller General who worked under both Democrat and Republican. Every one of them said, and granted, Democrats have a different set of solutions and strategies. Uh, there's probably some middle ground, and then we have ours, but no one, and I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, I'll end with it, no one thought that we were okay, that we could sustain the level of deficits and debt, and that there wouldn't be a payday someday and one that would be irreparable and even catastrophic. I haven't met anybody that at, in, my, in this hearing room in, on, at that dais, uh, 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 that witness table, saying anything of, of, uh, to the uh, contrary. With that, I yield back. I apologize. Thank you, uh, Chairman Swiker. Thank you for calling this meeting and a very important topic. Well, thank you. Yeah, uh, I would like to uh, fir first agree with my friend, Mr. Arrington, um, that this, this is an enormous concern. And uh, I don't know that all of us share it, but I've been a, a worried about the deficit for a long time, and it's only gotten worse and worse and worse. I do want to point out that the lowest poverty rate happened after COVID, when we spent $800 billion on unemployment insurance. We did economic impact payments. We did PPP loans where businesses throughout the world were held harmless and often made millions and millions of dollars. And we got child poverty down to 5.2, 5.3, and then most of those went away and it went back up to 12.7. But government funding was a huge part of that. It was also a pretty huge part of all the money that corporations were paying in because they had unprecedented profits as the profit margins were tripling and quadrupling. As a car dealer, I can tell you ours tripled and quadrupled too. Um, but that's neither here nor there. I, I didn't come to beat up on the TCJA. But I do want to thank uh, Dr. Klossing for always being uh, so good to us for your service in the administration, in and out. Um, but we do have, because the TCGA is expiring, we have the opportunity to fix a bunch of things, including a corporate tax rate, which could easily have been 26 and a half and gotten almost all the gains that, that we had before. Um, I, I specifically, though, we had a great Ways and Means dinner last night with the Dem side on Pillar 2 and trying to understand that. And we regularly hear from corporations that they want to preserve a tax code that's competitive relative to the rest of the world. Uh, Dr. Klausen, wouldn't complying with an international agreement that creates a floor on global corporate tax rates everywhere, including the Caymans and Cyprus, I won't pick, I'm not going to pick on wonderful companies like Switzerland, um, stop the race to the bottom and give the U.S greater freedom to design tax policy, not to compete with Zug, um, but actually to reflect our priorities. Absolutely, I really appreciate that question. Um, for a long time when we were trying to address the profit shifting and offshoring uh, features of current law, people would argue, well, you can't do that because some other country will obviously undercut us and we'll, our US firms will lose out to others in merger and acquisition bids. But lo and behold, we now have this international agreement coming into effect throughout the world that already covers more than 90% of the in-scope multinational companies that raises the bottom from zero to 15%. That gives countries like the United States a lot more freedom to address these longstanding problems without worrying about these competitiveness concerns. And it's exactly what the business community has been asking for a long time to help level that playing field. Thank you very much. Mr. Linden, you talk all about risk management, which is a wonderful way, way to think about this. Um, you know, I believe we should move towards fixing this budget deficit, but when you figure that 80% of it is things that every American wants, that even people like Donald Trump say you can't touch, uh, then, and we, we don't want to use our military, so we're looking at 8 to 10% of the budget to try to fix a problem that's much larger than that, especially because all that's our investment in our kids and things like that. So we turn to revenues. Um, and that, of course, is our, my problem with my dear Republican friends, is they won't look at it. Um, the president had in his uh, billionaire's minimum income tax, which Steve Cohen and I have, have been co-leading. And uh, he talks about other things, step up, up in basis, moving gift tax rates to where they were before, moving estate tax rates to where they were before. But my Republican friends will say, no, no, the wealthy job creators won't be able to create jobs anymore. Um, how do you see that from a risk management framework? 
Yeah, I, I appreciate that question. I want to make two points. One is that it's true that, uh, as some of my colleagues said, that spending on things like Social Security and Medicare have gone up over time as the population has aged. We've talked about that a little bit in this in this hearing. And those are those are commitments that we've made to America's seniors that are A, popular, as you said, every you know, broad bipartisan support for those policies. They work. They reduce poverty. They re they reduce senior, uh, you know, precarity. They're really they're re they're popular for a reason. And critically, we used to have a tax code that was able to finance the increase in costs. And instead of maintaining that tax code or building on it, we cut taxes repeatedly. And that's why now, even though those costs are rising, the debt is now rising with it. It didn't have to be this way. We could have chosen to simply finance those commitments the way we, we were before. Now we are in a bigger hole and we have to dig our way out of it. But the first thing you do when you're in a hole is you know, stop digging. So stop cutting taxes for people at the top. And that brings me to my second point, which is, look, at the end of the day, where does economic growth come from? Does it come from the titans of industry sitting in boardrooms deciding how many jobs they're going to create in a day? No, it doesn't. It comes from customers. It comes from workers. It comes from families doing their best from day to day. And that's where you want to invest. That's why we see the evidence that we do that investing in middle class families and low income families produces broad based economic growth. It doesn't come from giving tax cuts to people at the very top. Yeah, and, and Mr. Chairman, if just for 10 seconds, my, my Dr. Falkender was nodding his head no on the tax increases. I just want to say that as somebody who's kept the dealership books since 1975, I remember figuring tax rates out at 75% until we get to 1986. Somehow we kept growing and surviving. So they have gone way, way, way down from where they used to be. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a fascinating discussion. Uh, and in fact, uh, the chairman mentioned a fiscal commission. I think this would be exactly what a fiscal commission should be doing, is trying to come up with a shared set of facts and beliefs that we all can agree upon. Because there are uh, things mentioned here today that I think uh, probably most of us agree. You know, our, our birth rate and our demographics will not work for a growing economy going forward. We're going to have to increase the workforce petition rate and or increase immigration because we're going to need the workers to pay into the system. So I completely agree with that. Um, Mr. Linden, you mentioned <clears throat> that one of the important components of, of changing the debt to equity ratio is growing the economy. And so you know, we've got to, I, I completely agree, we've, we've got to figure out the right policies to grow the economy. So this is exactly the kind of discussion that, that uh, we, we, should, we should be having. Uh, I was surprised, Mr. Linden, um, that your perception of the debt is different than many that we hear. And I'd like to just explore that a little because this is sort of a fundamental um, you know, fact base, if you will, or you know, a problem that we have to agree on. Uh, you know, my perception is <clears throat> that, that the debt is projected to grow, the debt to GDP is going to grow, uh, according to CBO, to almost 200% in the next 30, 50 years. 172%, I think, in the next 30 years. You, your quote, and I've read your testimony as well, but you said here you think there's, uh, you think the evidence of high debt being a problem is mixed. So are you not concerned? I mean, as far as we can see, revenues are on a certain line. And even if we make changes to revenue, and then spending is another one, so the gap's going to continue to increase. Like, is, is that not, you don't think that's a legitimate concern? Oh, I do think it's a legitimate yeah. concern. I think okay. risks. At what are, level? Well, that's that's the question. <clears throat> right? mm -hmm. Risks are different than certainties. And if you had asked people ten years ago, they would have said ninety percent of GDP. That's going to be that's the threshold. If we're there, then things fall apart. And that turned out to not be true. And if you'd asked people before that, they would have given you a different number. And I think the point that I really want to make is we should, instead of saying we are definitely headed for a calamity and therefore we're willing to do anything we can to avoid that calamity, we should take the risk seriously, look at what the evidence actually says. Does higher debt in inevitably lead to higher interest rates? The answer to that question is no, by, by our historical experience. Are, are, Could are you, it lead to higher interest rates? Yes. And that's why we need to be thoughtful about these. Are you concerned about a possible sovereign debt crisis at some point? And, and what I'm talking about is where people no longer, people buying the treasuries no longer believe that the U.S. has the ability to repay, and so they stop 
buying treasuries. I mean, that would be, a, I mean, first of all, you agree that would be a calamity. That would, would be, be very bad. Yeah. Are uh, you concerned I think about the way that? that we want to reduce yeah. the risk of something like that happen, to be clear, no evidence that that's, we're on the cusp of that or anything like, like that. Yeah. But, but it's a risk, and we should take risks seriously. And like we do in any other area of our life, we should measure those risks based on how likely they are, how big they are. I wish we had more time, uh, and I'd love to give the yeah. two of you a chance. And what I'm looking for, and I can uh, point you in the right direction, you know, we have, I don't know, you've all read Ray Dalio's book, I don't know, but like there, there are plenty of examples of countries and empires that have risen and fallen and my perception, at least, is often it's because of their fiscal policies. You know, you had the British Empire for, you know, for centuries, you had the Dutch Empire, and, and they're gone. I, I'm, I'm concerned this could happen to America. And so what I'm, you know, have any of you looked at history and, and tried to extrapolate, like, where we are and where we're headed if, if we don't change course? I mean, Mr. Lynn and you obviously aren't as concerned, but I'd be interested in hearing from the two of you as well. So Congressman, my read of the literature on the 90% figure is that countries have not had financial crises, uh, debt crises below 90% of GDP, debt to GDP ratios, that they have all occurred above 90. Now it does not mean that once you hit 90, you hit a debt crisis. It just says that's where they happen. Japan's been above 200% for a while, but Japan has a much higher savings rate. Now, the US has the world's reserve currency, which means that our threshold is going to be higher. The challenge that we have is that we don't know where the threshold is, and it will be a moment, it'll be a crisis of confidence moment, and you don't know what's going to spark that. I testified a couple of months ago with a, a former Treasury colleague uh, who now runs the Penn Wharton budget model. And his testimony was that we don't know when, but 20 years from now, there will be no interest rate that will clear the treasury bond market at the best 20 years from now. I don't wanna find out what that looks like, and that means we need to get our fiscal house in order today. I can just add one point. One of the risks is that uh, we might end up in a scenario where we have what's so-called fiscal dominance, where the Federal Reserve no longer makes policy based on containing inflation, but on the basis of uh, supporting the Treasury in continuing to finance government spending should it become difficult to borrow from uh, bond markets. And there what you're looking at is we had a fairly recent experience with that, very high uh, rates of inflation, recurring bouts of inflation which create uncertainty in the market and cause a lot of harm and pain for exactly the types of populations that can bear that risk the least, which is why I think that it's uh, very encouraging that Congress is advancing uh, the, the idea of a fiscal commission to have those discussions before a fiscal crisis or uh, another unexpected calamity forces legislators' hands. I'm apparently out of time, but thank you. Maybe we aren't as far apart as initially we would, uh, it, it sounded, but uh, yeah, yeah, wait, I know, I'm out of time. Thank you. <laughs> How about it? Mr. Smucker, you're out of time. <laughs> uh, thank you, Vice Chairman Swigert, uh, the staff. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here today. Uh, the latest CBO budget forecast uh, held debt uh, for the public to increase from 99% GDP in 2024, 116% uh, as the groundwork by 2034. What is important to acknowledge that these trends are not set in stone? What can we do? The American people are dependent each and all of us to come together find solutions. We have to increase revenue, and we have to extend the solvency of social supports. Of course, we have to yield good returns. So we can, by one, I think, reforming our immigration system. Mr. Smucker touched on it. Two, making the ultra-wealthy uh, and corporations pay their fair share. And three, inc increasing workers' ability, as was mentioned, to join our labor force, boost revenue, balance the budget for the long term. This leads to my first question, Mr. Linden. The Penn Wharton budget model, which I'm pretty familiar with, having been involved in it from the beginning, states that exempting ex applicants uh, with advanced STEM degrees from employment-based green card caps, exempting them from those caps, would reduce the federal budget deficit by $129 billion over 10 years. The CBO then projects 5 million more immigrants. I love immigration. Five million more immigrants would add an additional $1 trillion to our tax revenue over 10 years. That's real money. What's, can you speak to the impact that would, this reform would have on our labor force 
in revenue and how this could drive our local and national economies, protect Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid for generations? Mr. Linden. That's a great question. Look, I think we should ground ourselves in some basic facts, which is that right now we have the highest labor force participation rate in the United States for prime age workers that we've seen in 20 years. Yep. And we've talked about some of our demographic challenges. We know that those are those are real and you know, they don't have to be challenges. They just are what they are. The American people as a whole are getting older and we can so we can help uh, expand our economy with with more workers. Uh, that can come through as we've talked about higher birth rates, but also through legal immigration. And so those, that's why the CBO says what it says about immigration being really good for our fiscal future. I do want to point, make the point you, you, you I want to double click on the point you said, which is, look, uh, what creates growth in this country? Growth does not come from the top. It comes from entrepreneurs. It comes from workers. It comes from families. And when we attract the highest, uh, you know, highest talent, highest skilled, uh, people from all over the world to the United States, that's good for everybody. That's gonna raise wages, it creates jobs, it creates more growth, and it does create more revenue into the, into the treasury to help us with our fiscal risks. How many immigrants are we take in a year on average? Is it about a million, million a year? Sorry, repeat the question. How many immigrants are we bringing in for the last 20 some years? Legal immigrants. I would have to go back and check the question. It's about a million a year. I'm what would happen if we took that number to five million immigrants and we did that every year? Maybe that would reduce pressure on the border if we process those folks at their orange country of origin. So that would like, originally they could go to their own country, consulate, an embassy, et cetera. One million to five million. Any thoughts? I would really want to defer that question to true immigration experts. I do not consider myself that. What I will say is that, look, when we want to think about reducing our fiscal risk, we need to expand the economy. We need to invest in things that grow the economy. We know that having more workers, more businesses, more, you know, would higher you say wages. The best way to do that, the best single way to do that would be more immigration, legal immigration. I wouldn't want to <laughs> say that that's... We're not going to move the birth yeah. rate. When and the birth rate's not moving, you can't get that done. I, I, think, it, I think the bank... What else you got? I got nothing else. I mean, you can invest in early childhood education too, but those things aren't... aren't, aren't a, we shouldn't pit those things against each other. We can do both of those things. Okay. Thank you. Uh, baseline, uh, tax cuts, loopholes, corporations, wealthy, ultra-wealthy, uh, definitely damaging our nation's fiscal health, devastating families. Public school teacher might make pay a higher tax rate than... Uh, someone that makes a significant amount of money. Uh, that's wrong. Dr. Clausing, could you talk about quickly Bush tax cuts, the Trump tax scam, and their extensions have, imp their extensions have impacted the economy? Yes, absolutely. Um, we haven't seen either of those lead to a big boost in growth or really any discernible boost in growth or investment. And um, certainly it's reduced corporate tax revenues in the case of the Trump tax cuts and revenues writ large in, in both instances. So um, there's no evidence that that's really been a wise investment of, of fiscal dollars. And, and just on the immigration front, too, I, I, I will agree with you that I think this is an incredibly important thing to do. And that if you look at the share of new businesses and Fortune 500 companies that are founded by immigrants, you're going to get not just labor force participation, but you're going to get entrepreneurship, innovation, and growth. 40% founded by yeah, immigrants of the next generation. Yeah. Apple, Google, eBay, the yeah. list never ends. Immigrants create tens of millions of jobs. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, each of you, for being here. I'm going to start with a very simple question. How many of you sitting at this table have, have opened a small business and operated it for more than a decade? I, I, I got you down there, Don. <clears throat> how, many, how many of you have worked back in rural districts in a small business? I've worked in one, but I haven't founded one. You haven't founded one. So, yeah, yeah all right. So, so yeah. the, the reason I'm asking that question is that we're talking about some really big stuff here, okay? Um, and there's a lot of room for debate on that. But I want to go back to what works and what's not working in our small business community right now. Um, it, it, <clears throat> inflationary pressures are incredible. Regulatory <laughs> burdens are, and how they are enforced in a very prescriptive manner are crushing to the small business community. Um, these, these are businesses that are innovating. These are businesses that are creating jobs. And, and this is where, the, the, this is where the, the next great idea always comes from, is somebody's small business in a garage, okay? 
And what we keep doing with a lot of these policies is making our economy bigger in terms of the participants in the economy versus making it work for smaller businesses, and particularly those in rural areas. So I, I, I want to really emphasize how important it is right now that we form this debt commission and where we work in a bipartisan manner to really get to a, a really good set of facts that we can then begin to make really good decisions on. We, we, we argue all the time about this policy is better, that policy is better. I'm going to give you one example. How many of you think that we should be making decisions on the CBO score? The Congressional Budget Office scoring of when we do policy, how, how, how many of you think that we should actually be using that number as the basis for our decision? Okay, it is wildly wrong. If you take a CBO score and go out 10 years, it's wrong every time in their 10-year estimate, almost every single time. They use static scoring instead of dynamic scoring. Let me give you a perfect example. Um, when we, on paper, if you look at the Affordable Care Act, um, it said that we would have better access, better utilization, better outcomes, and lower cost. Well, let's look at where we are based off of CBO scoring. The first question is, is America healthier now than it was a decade ago? The answer is no. Are costs up or down? Costs are up. We may have better access, but do we have better utilization of the system? The answer is no. If you look at the CBO scoring as it relates to, as, as it relates to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, how many, we had greater than expected revenues coming in from that. Does, any, does anybody argue with that? I think that's not right. You don't, you don't think it's right. So no, we've got you, record, we have record revenues coming in. No. Okay. La last year's revenues were 16.5% of GDP. It's, it's worth noting, yes, of course, in the year before that, there was a record year, but that was, as, as my it's, colleague it's, noted, it's, kind of an aberration. 16.5% of GDP was the revenue. That's one of the lowest in, in recent history. In 2000, before the Bush tax cuts and the Trump tax cuts. How do, how do, you, fa how do you factor in inflation into the GDP? Does that skew it at all? It's, no, it doesn't, because it's the nominal amount of revenue raised divided by the nominal GDP, 16.5%. All right. Um, Dr. Faulkner, do you think that we should be doing things from, from a business standpoint that encourage investment here domestically, that encourage research and development here domestically, and do you think we should make every effort to transfer wealth from around the world to the U.S.? I think we should be creating a business environment that is competitive globally, and so this is where I'm going to just greatly disagree with some of the other panelists, because if you look at the pre-TCJA world, if you operated a business here in the United States, you contemporaneously paid a 35% corporate income tax rate. In TCJA, we brought that down to 21%. If you operate a multinational, you were able to essentially, especially if you're a significant intellectual property firm, you're able to move the, the royalties from intellectual property over to a tax haven country and essentially uh, evade corporate income tax, avoid corporate income tax on it. And so by implementing guilty, we took the tax rate on foreign IP profits from essentially zero up to 11%. So it seems to me that prior to TCJA, it was 35 for a small company located here in the United States uh, or a domestic company doing something here versus essentially zero. Instead of 35 versus zero, it went to 21 versus 11. That encouraged domestic activity, not discouraged. Mr. Chairman, may I make one? I know my time has expired. May I make one more? Ask one more question. Um, we're, we're in this battle right now. If, if you're running, a, if you're running a business, particularly a small business, um, there is limited revenue stream. Okay, you can do an elastic pricing model. You can raise prices to a certain point, but then consumers cannot afford that. You've got to create headroom in there for for a business to operate, to be creative, to take risks, to make investments. Would anybody on this panel, if if the answer is raising taxes, would you simultaneously be willing to greatly reduce the regulatory burden, not necessarily the goals of what you want the regulation to be, but the prescriptive nature in which those regulations are applied to multinationals as well as small businesses? I think there's room for streamlining some regulations, um, but you know, I wouldn't take them to zero. I think they, they serve a very useful purpose in some I'm, 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 yeah. But, but there's room to streamline, yeah. Thank you. I, thank you. Thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Well, that was interesting. <laughs> <laughs>
Hey, there's most people. I, I didn't really actually want that loud. <laughs> no, Miss Byer, something quick. Just the quick thing to pull on Dr. Ferguson. Yes, you know if we could get the 16 and a half percent back up to the 20 that it was back 20 years ago when George W. Bush was president. Um, we have to be open to spending cuts and to regulatory reform. Absolutely. I really wish we would use the language smart regulation. The reality of the world of the technology we live in today, um, the way we do much of our regulation is absurd. It's a 1938 design model when you could crowdsource much of what we do. But then again, no one's ever watched the YouTube video I did on I did this great cartoon on how to use technology. Um, I do want to, the prerogative of getting to sit in the bigger chair, I have a handful of things I just want to touch on. Um, Mr. Linden, um, I want you to provide the committee the paper that says debt levels do not affect long-term interest rates because I have the Peterson Foundation article that says just the opposite and their study. And I'm going to submit that to the record I think it's only fair to let you submit your article or your data set that contradicts um, the Peterson Foundation's. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, um, Vice Chairman. And, and just to be very clear, my point is simply that if you look at the observed relationship, if you look at a graph of interest rates paid on tre yeah, 10 year it's treasuries. Not straight because if you have to look at um, liquidity provided by the Fed and then the rolling off the balance sheets. So, um, from a monetarist standpoint, mm, you get some real noise in the data. It, the, the data is noisy, but if you look for the past 40 years, if you if you had told anybody in 1985 yep, when my, interest rates were, what, four times what they are today, that the debt was going to go from 30% of GDP to 90% of GDP, no, no, I, I when interest rates go up or down. But I'm, what I'm not just simply asking for is, is provide me the paper. I, right. I'd love to read it. Um, um, for anyone on the panel, is it rational? How many other countries, particularly in the industrialized world, OECD, um, do not actually give a score for internal borrowing. If, you, if someone were to grab their phone right now and look up OECD's calculation for U.S. Um, debt to GDP, they have us at 144%. And um, do we intend not to pay back the money? Of course we intend to pay back the money. But we've actually had a couple months, I believe, where we actually borrowed money to be able to make the payments on our borrowed money. Um, and the fact of the matter is we, we pay interest to the funds, as, as is only appropriate, um, but it, 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 I just, I, and this, is a, this goes back actually to my finance classes back in the dark ages. Um, we had this debate, is it appropriate how the United States says, oh, it's only publicly held, yet you have several trillion over here that you are paying interest on that you do owe and you will, at this current rate, going to have to either tax or borrow to actually pay back those trust funds. I mean, give me an opinion. Is it, is it do we play actually a shell game with ourselves? It, to me, depends on the question that you're asking. So if you're asking where market interest rates are going to find their equilibrium, then it's publicly held debt that's okay. relevant, right? But if you want to understand what are the long-term obligations, as, again, somebody who oversaw the trustees process for Social Security and Medicare, we very much want to make sure that the revenue stream that comes from the trust fund's assets are incorporated into the expectations of being able to finance Social Security and Medicare. So depending on the question you're asking, it's going to vary which okay, measure. Okay, so it's more the unfunded at. liability. And Mr. Lynn, but actually sort of, sort this of is almost, a really great touched, point. almost touched on this yeah. actually when you were talking. To be very, very clear, so we're all very clear, CBO's long-term projections essentially do that. They assume that all obligations in Social Security and Medicare will be fully paid regardless of the status of the trust and, fund. And that's what, but so that's the you're publicly sort of held debt. The publicly held debt projections in the CBO's projections are an accurate reflection of our obligations. And that's why publicly held debt is the right way to think about it. The, it's not that the gross the intergovernmental debt is not real. It absolutely is. I completely agree with you. Those are real obligations that the government will have to pay. But it is fully captured in the CBO projections of so, publicly held debt. Yeah. It, it's, it's, but in realizing that every month we've been functionally, it is a f uh, effect of our current borrow because we, I don't think we have other than employee, uh, government employees, really any major trust funds that are actually growing 
all of them are bleeding. And so now each are a negative draw. And, and I don't think there's a complete understanding here that you know um, we're going to bleed out the Social Security Trust Fund over the next eight, nine years. So one way to think um, about this, Vice Chairman, is if you snapped your fingers today and said, instead of financing Social Security through a trust fund, we were just going to finance everything through the general fund. I'm not saying we should do that or shouldn't do that, but just as an exercise no, no. to think about this. You said, no more trust fund. We're going to get rid of the, public, the intergovernmental debt, but we're not going to change a single benefit, and we're not going to change a single tax policy. Would that change the projections? No, no, the, the long, long run stays exactly, exactly the same. Exactly the same. Big, but it stays right. exactly the same because those trust funds are basically gone. Right, right? because we already capital. assume that we will, the, those projections assume that we will pay those obligations. Yeah, well, of so course. No, no. That's why it's very important to, I don't, I don't focus on the, the intergovernmental debt for economic reasons because the obligations are fully captured in the debt projections. Okay, Mr. Byer. And, no, 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 do this. I, I actually like the conversation model. It drives the poor witnesses insane, but uh, it makes me happy. Well, as long as I, I just wanted to, I read a number of interesting articles over the weekend about how we've gone from a, a global savings glut to a global savings drought, that it is drying up uh, almost everywhere. And I'd be really interested, I don't know who to ask the question to, about what you think that's going to end up doing to interest rates. That's actually a so there's been an interesting hypothesis that one of the things the pandemic did is it changed people's willingness to delay consumption. So if you think about the savings rate, sorry to get really finance professor nerdy on you, but there's a, <laughs> savings essentially the compensation for deferring consumption, right? And so to the extent that people equate Consuming now versus consuming later, that's going to drive your interest rate in equilibrium. Now, if what the pandemic did is it made people think more about today because tomorrow may not be here, not no so, so much because of death, but because you may all of a sudden be locked down for two years, we're seeing this much greater desire to, there seems to be a less sensitivity to things like spending on vacations. People are willing to do it because you never know when you're going to get locked down. That means that there's going to be a savings reduction because, or you're going to have to have a higher interest rate in order to induce the same amount of savings to finance the outstanding debt. And so that's the hypothesized relationship as to why it may, we may see that this reduction in savings to the extent that it's explained by this change in behavior could lead to a higher equilibrium interest rate in order to compensate people for the savings that necessarily fund debt. Did that make sense? Not at all. That's gonna that that change in preferences is probably global because the whole world experienced that kind of, of outcome. But it's more acute in the United States because we already had low savings rates to begin with. I would add a further point, and that is that, as uh, the vice chair mentioned earlier, this is also a, a demographic reality because one thing that also happened during the pandemic is that more uh, older individuals that could still work decided to retire early, and so you you. Have fits there. Um, you know, and I, and I do agree that we should have more bipartisan conversations, and I appreciate Vice Chairman's um, <laughs> Schweikert's uh, uh, plea for that. You know, I think um, JCT and the CBO are national treasures that try to bring nonpartisan analysis to things, and of course they get some scores wrong at times, and of course forecasting is difficult, and they should ceaselessly try to do that better. But um, I do think it, it behooves us to at least have some factual organizations that we're all looking at and we're like, okay, this is what the nonpartisan group is saying about the truth of what revenue came in, you know, and there will be fluctuations. But, you know, I think that's a, it's a very important thing to build on. We, we, we also think that the Joint Economic Committee is a national treasure. Yes. <laughs> you know, with the, the barriers here. Um, to Mr. Byers' um, step up and basis, um, I have an economic paper somewhere in one of my binders. I have this bad habit of being a pack rat um, that was talking about one of the reasons you might have less turn in the economy, even though basis has the adjustments and the 1031s and some of the other things in there, is because so much of your growth in your basis is actually inflation. So do you sell an asset that and pay taxes on something that's, you know, your your alternative, you know, your reinvestment 
is also now at a new higher basis because how much is, is true appreciation and how much is just inflation. Um, and so you almost need an inflation shock absorber at somewhat part of the math. So, you know, you get that economic velocity. I mean, w w it w is it wrong to actually think about um, saying, okay, if he, w if he wants to affect basis, we should at least have an inflation calculator in there. Inflation is definitely part of the situation, but one thing to bear in mind is that investors also benefit from deferral, right? When you earn income no, year no. after year, somebody takes out the money every single time you earn it, right? Whereas if you're if you have something invested, right, in that whole time that it's growing free of tax, it's going to grow to a much larger number than it would otherwise, right? And that deferral advantage um, is much larger than the inflation disadvantage. You're exactly no, right. It, it, you need to adjust to it, but uh, it, being yeah. someone who actually managed some resources, um, what we would often do is just borrow off of it. So, yeah, I mean, you can I mean, borrow against it. Duck? Yeah, so I, I to, to the congressman's earlier question, I, I've never really particularly understood why we, I think the basis step up existed because if you go back decades, it was very difficult for heirs to figure out what was the original basis of the asset when my when my forebearers originally purchased it. If you look at the electronification of financial record keeping, I think that that's a much less salient argument today. And to be honest, I would much rather see the sale of the asset be the taxable event than the death of the owner be the taxable event. And so if you were to ask me, I would prefer a basis step up over an estate tax. I think that's a much more economically efficient uh, way to go after accumulated capital gains. If, if we're really going after stuff right now, I would also say that I don't think that people should be able to borrow, again, and I'm speaking entirely for myself now, um, I thought that when Elon Musk purchased Twitter, the idea that he could borrow against his Twitter stock and not pay capital gains taxes on that, rather than liquidate the, the Twitter holdings in order to come up with the money, and then I think count on a basis step up to at the, at the end of his estate in order to essentially permanently avoid that uh, that run-up. I, I think that that is a problem in the tax code that we should be able to find bipartisan just, consensus on fixing. So, uh, bipartisan consensus. My former colleague at OMB, Zach Liskow, has a proposal to tax the borrowing of uh, against un, unrealized gains for exactly that reason. So there's bipartisan. That would raise $100 billion so, over the next year. All right. My only point, and then we're, I'm going to gavel those down so we can go back and do something useful. For staff, for, for staff who's watching this, Think about it, in the last six minutes, you had actually more intellectually robust conversation than we did in the previous hour. Help us figure out a way to do more of this. All right, and with that, I'd like to thank everyone for being here. Um, I'm gonna, let's make it seven days to get the articles in. And with that, we're adjourned.